Back now on Morning Joe, talking to Admiral James Savridis and Dr. Evelyn Farkas. Heidi. All right, Admiral, so this is happening at a moment of unique disruption worldwide mm -hmm. in terms of Europe kind of moving ahead without us on security arrangements. And now you see the Chinese and the, and the Russians teaming up. What is our role in all of this and what are the implications for the U.S.? We ought to start with being deeply concerned about Europe where centrifugal forces are really pulling this place apart and they're moving forward but they're all moving in a different direction right so the Brits pulling out to the north in the east the Poles the Hungarians are kind of walking away from the value set of the European Union in the south the Italians are adamantly anti European Union that's concern number one that our greatest pool of partners and allies are kind of pulling apart while China and Russia are drawing together that's geopolitics 101 at the moment. So what we ought to do about it, Heidi, is do everything we can to try and encourage European unity. We shouldn't be in Europe arguing for the pullout of Brexit. We should be trying everything we can to build on this network of allies, partners, and friends globally, not only in Europe, but in Asia with the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Australians, and New Zealanders. We have great allies. We're to be doing everything we can to bring them together because as that Chinese and Russian land mass comes together, that becomes a global concern for us. I want to pick up on the China-Russian, sure. uh, the, there was a great analogy in terms of Ghostbusters and tariffs because they're kind of at, at dual purposes. Obviously agree on tariffs as far as you become a student of history, obviously what it does to the economy. Having said that though, when you start to see China going to get 5G and start to dominate us in technology, if we get behind 20, 30 years from now, it's over for us. And one of the only tools we do have is tariffs. So I'm usually pretty clear on my opinion on things, although I'm not going to I'm wrong. On tariffs, <laughs> Steve, there seems to be such a conundrum on both sides of that argument. Well, look, it's, it's a tough set of choices. Tariffs, as we talked about earlier, don't do us uh, any particular good. They raise prices, they slow the economy, they make things more expensive for consumers. But there are times when you need to use them. When you say you might wake up in five years and find that we're behind on 5G, or, uh, we're already behind on 5G. We're not even in the game on we'll 5G. Keep, keep extrapolating terms, with it, all technology. With all technology. Look, China is a really, really scary economic force and it and and it needed, needs to be dealt with this is not the way to deal with it but there is a role for tariffs in dealing with countries like China using tariffs with Mexico on immigration Different. is like without precedent and makes absolutely no sense yeah I'll just pick up on that point and say tariffs and trade are not apples and oranges they're apples and hubcaps they just don't make sense trying to use them together in Mexico the point I wanted to make on China is we do need to Denny your point we do need to bend China in order to get them more in compliance globally. But we got to be careful we don't break it, because when you break it, then you're back in that 1930s scenario. So bend but not break, I think, is the course here. President Trump spoke yesterday about another adversary, Iran, when he was sitting in a breast briefing with President Macron of France. Let's listen. Mr. President, two leaders have had differences over Iran in the past. Do those differences remain? I don't think that the president wants to see nuclear weapons, and neither do I, and that's what it's all about. He doesn't want to see them having nuclear weapons, and I don't want to see them having nuclear weapons, and they won't have nuclear weapons. Uh, with that being said, you know, let's see what happens with Iran. But when I became president, uh, hard to believe, two and a half years ago, now more, uh, Iran was uh, a true state of terror. They still are, but they were undisputed champions of terror, and that's a bad thing. And we had 14 different locations where they were fighting, causing between Yemen and Syria, but many other locations and many other battle sites. And it was all about Iran. They were behind every one of them. They're not doing that anymore. They're doing very poorly as a nation. They're failing as a nation. And I don't want them to fail as a nation. They can, we can turn that around very quickly. But the sanctions have been extraordinary how, how powerful they've been and other things. I understand they want to talk, and if they want to talk, that's fine. We'll, we'll talk. But the one thing that they can't have is they can't have nuclear weapons. And I think the president of France would agree with that very strongly. I think that he would agree that they cannot have nuclear weapons. 
Evelyn, Iran is one of the biggest differences between Europe and the United States at the moment, but there are a host of others, and we've been talking about them all week. And there's some speculation amongst European diplomats that I speak to that four years of Trump is very different from eight years of Trump. If it's only four years, you can kind of go back to the status quo ante, a resumption of the Western liberal order. These alliances can be maintained and bolstered, and we're kind of back where we were. But I wonder actually whether we haven't even with or without Trump having eight years in office, entered into a different phase just because of China, and that China is really the game changer here, and that power is up for grabs, and the Chinese are grabbing it, as, as uh, Steve was saying there, on the tech front, they're already doing so. Well, I think, Hattie, I mean, I agree with you that if we had four more years of President Trump and his foreign policy, you know, such as it is, basically undermining the liberal democratic institutions that we built together with our allies and undermining the leadership of our allied nations, to include to some extent in Asia, uh, it would be a disaster. But um, the Chinese threat, I think the Europeans are, and you may disagree with me somewhat, but I think the Europeans are starting to wake up to it. I was in Brussels at NATO headquarters um, helping them with a big exercise that they do every couple of years um, to flex their muscles. And, you know, they still don't have, obviously, consensus on the China threat, but there's a lot of alarm. A lot of the conversations behind the scenes were, okay, also, what do we do about China? It's not just Russia. It's also China, the economic and the political pressure. You know, we talked about the, what China's doing in terms of um, bribing European countries you know, providing for them infrastructure, roads and ports, but they're also essentially creating access for themselves, which could be military access, certainly political access. And the Europeans have realized that they're, some, of their, some of their member states in the European mm -hmm. Union for, in particular are in some trouble over this. Jeremy Bash, back to the president's comments on Iran just for a second there, because you heard him say, if Iran wants to talk, we'll talk. And President Macron quickly jumped on that and said, that's very important. We have to remain open to negotiations. You can almost see uh, Macron speaking for Europe, worried about some of the signals we've seen coming out of the White House toward Iran. I think it is concerning uh, because uh, the president and his administration did really hype up a, a threat against yeah. uh, U.S. forces in the region. And I think we came as close to military conflict over the last month with Iran as we've been in a long, long time. Of course, I agree with the president's comments that Iran is a terrorist state, but the president is papering over a major difference between the United States and the approach of Europe, where we have withdrawn from the Iran deal, the deal that constrains <laughs> Iran's nuclear program. We have reimposed sanctions. And yes, those sanctions are are biting, but to make them truly effective, they have to be multilateral, which they are, of course, not at this moment. So I think it's best if we get on the same page as our European allies, keep the pressure on Iran's nuclear program, and that, I think, can uh, really address the issue uh, more, more comprehensively. And Europe, Admiral, doesn't know what page we're on from day to day. No, they don't. And, and that's kind of where we started the conversation, right? We can have one good speech by the president, but that does not put the impetus back, the genie that's come out of the bottle is European unity. That ought to concern us deeply. I was the 16th Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. The first was Dwight Eisenhower. He said the greatest strategic advantage of the United States of America in the, at that time, 20th century was a Europe unified, whole and free. We had to be working in that direction, not trying to pull it apart. Good lesson for the president this morning. Admiral James DeVritis, thank you as always. Dr. Evelyn Farkas, thank you both. Still ahead this morning, jobs numbers come out later this morning. And Steve Ratner says economic signals starting to flash yellow and in some cases red. He's got charts to prove it next on Morning Joe. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.